So, welcome to the Dr. Gundry Podcast. Today we're sitting down with nightclub owner turned philanthropist, Scott Harrison, who's been a friend of mine for a couple years now. He's got a remarkable story about how he found a way to bring clean water to 8.5 million people. Scott's the founder of the clean water nonprofit Charity Water, and we've actually worked together on a number of projects. So thanks a lot for joining us, Scott. Hey, it's good to be here. Thanks for having me on. It's nice to see you. Good to see you again. And I'm going to see you, uh, what, in a little over a month for the annual fundraiser. Yes, we're so excited. I'm so glad you and Penny are coming up for it. It'll be great. great. We, we've been working on it for months. We have a big idea. All right, great. So here's Scott's book, and it's called Thirst. And it's going to be available actually right about the time you're viewing this podcast. So, uh, Scott, I was telling you before we started that I read this on the plane a couple weeks ago, and Penny, my wife, read it, and we couldn't put it down. Tell me, in 25 words or less, no, not really, uh, how this came about. And tell me your story, because this is not about just water. This is Scott's history, and uh, take us on the roller coaster. Yeah, well, okay, so I think kind of three acts to my life. The first act was um, growing up in a suburban family. Uh, I, was, I was born into a middle-class family. My dad was a business guy and my mom was a writer. And when I was four, uh, we moved into this house, a new house in South, uh, South Jersey. And unbeknownst to us, there was a carbon monoxide gas leak. Now, this was almost 40 years ago. They had not yet invented the detector that we go buy in blister packs, right, at the Home Depot. And we just didn't know this. My, my dad and I start getting some symptoms. My mom on New Year's Day, 1980, walks across the bedroom and she collapses unconscious. And it, it, it took a series of blood tests to identify huge amounts of carboxyhemoglobin, carbon dioxide in her bloodstream. And, and thankfully she didn't die, but her immune system was irreparably uh, destroyed. So, so never, she was never the same again. And, and I watched my mom go from this healthy, vibrant, you know, a, a picture of health to, um, to an invalid wearing charcoal masks, uh, walking around with oxygen tanks, uh, living in, in a, a containment room covered in tinfoil. So just weird stuff. And her body just became unable to fight off anything chemical, you know, whether it be perfume or car fumes or the ink from books. And, you know, some people thought this was in her head, but she she knew it wasn't. And family planning stopped. And I just grew up that good kid taking care of mom, doing the cooking, doing the cleaning. Uh, I, I played piano in church every Sunday and I played by the rules. I didn't smoke. I didn't sleep around. I didn't drink. I didn't cuss. And then 18 happened. Act two. <laughs> Moved to New York City, joined a band, grew my hair down past my shoulders, which was a terrible idea, uh, looking back at photos now. And uh, <laughs> after, after moving to New York City uh, as, you know, to be rich and famous and you know, sex, drugs, and rock and roll, really to explore the opposite of my life, uh, I became a nightclub promoter. And, and I just couldn't believe that there was an actual profession where you could get paid to drink. I mean, you could professionally drink and make hundreds of thousands of dollars doing this. And all you had to do was fill up the right nightclubs with the beautiful people and then the people with money. And, you know, you could charge $20 for a vodka soda. Or you could charge uh, $1,000 for a bottle of champagne that costs 50 So for the next 10 years, I began climbing up the social ladder, trying to become the king of New York nightlife. And I worked at 40 different nightclubs over that time. Work, and work, 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 work. Well, I mean, it didn't feel like work, right? You're, you're partying three nights a week. I'm flying around to Milan and Paris and it's fashion week. And, you know, I'm, I'm collecting all of the different things that I thought would, would make me happy. The, the BMW, the Rolex watch, the model girlfriend on the cover of fashion magazines, the, 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 the grand piano in my New York apartment, the, the Labrador retriever. And, you know, you can also imagine I, I've picked up all of the vices that would come with the territory. So at 18, I start smoking Marlboro Reds, and I, I smoke two to three packs a day for 10 years. I develop a massive drinking problem, a massive cocaine problem, ecstasy, MDMA, Special K, uh, gambling, pornography, strip clubs, I mean, you name it, 
I've, I've, I've got it all. The American dream. The American dream, right? And, and then, okay, you're going to love this. Ten years in, half my body goes numb. Inexplicably. Right? My, my business partner in the nightlife is like, dude, why don't you chill on the Coke, right? Why don't you chill on the cigarettes? Like, you're not exactly a picture of health here. But I, I start seeing neurologists. Uh, they give me brain scans. You know, they're attaching wires to my arms and my legs. And I just can't feel anything. I mean, I'll have these episodes where I put my hand under boiling hot water and I just can't feel it. You know, I could have hit it with a hammer. And, you know, this, this was a real awakening for me. Um, in, in some ways I was just faced with mortality. I mean, I was living like I was going to live forever. Nothing could stop us, you know, Coke to come up, Ambien to come down, and then we'd do it all over again. And I go to South America around this time and I have this amazing vacation and we've rented a compound and there are servants and there are horses and there, there's, we spent a thousand bucks on fireworks that we just blow up next to the pool. Magnums of Dom Perignon. I mean, it doesn't get any better than this. And I realized uh, that kind of suddenly, but, but almost in a moment, I had actually become the worst person that I knew. I, I was morally decrepit. I was morally bankrupt. I was spiritually bankrupt. And I'd come so far from any shred of faith or spirituality that I'd actually been brought up with. And you know, besides the health problems, like if I actually continued down this path, if I even lived to the age of 40, which was dubious, uh, the legacy I was leaving was perhaps the most meaningless legacy on earth. Right? My tombstone might actually read, here lies Scott Harrison who's gotten millions wasted. Yeah, and I knew me, I needed to make a change. And let me interrupt you with that. All through this, as you write in the book, your, you know, your devout Christian parents, your, <laughs> I don't want to put words in your mouth, but you're kind of mocking them. And, yeah. and at the same time, they're, they've got prayer groups organized for you. Yeah, they're right? on their knees. I mean, they have churches on their knees. They have those little old ladies, you know, wearing the hole in the carpets. Yeah. And, and just praying for the prodigal to come home. I mean, I'm living out the cliche of the prodigal son, right? I gave my finger to my family. I gave my finger to the church and said, now it's my turn. Yeah. Right? And, and, and I wound up in the proverbial pig pen. Like, it didn't work out well. And I wanted to come home. And, and that's what happened. So at 28, I, I asked myself, well, what would it look like to come back to faith? What would it look like to come back to morality and you know, to virtue? And, and what would the, the, the question, the specific question I asked myself was, what would the exact opposite of my hedonistic, sycophantic, selfish life look like? What would the 180 degree turn? Not, not the pivot, not the 20 degree turn or the 45. What would it look like to walk so far in the other direction? And... Uh, the only thing I could think of was to quit nightlife, leave it all behind. And there was a, there's an incident I write about in the book that made that pretty easy with guns and drugs and lots of stuff involved, but, uh, to leave it all behind and to try to give one year back in service to others, uh, to go serve the poor, to see if I had anything to offer. And I wanted to do that in the poorest country in the world, in my mind. And I also realized I would have to quit those vices. I would have to quit smoking and quit drugging and quit gambling and porn and all that stuff. I would have to clean up my life, you know, in, in a dramatic way to even allow a new story to unfold. And uh, that whole thing took about six months. But being a pretty radical guy, there was a moment where I sold all my possessions. I put 2,000 DVDs up on eBay in a single lot. And I began applying to porno the famous, DVDs, right? Uh, dude, like all of it. I mean, you know, it was it was just a big, you know, uh, pay 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 this big amount, and you're gonna get a surprise chest. Yeah, <laughs> let me stop you again. So, you know, I I take care of uh, lots of addicted individuals or formerly addicted individuals, and there's there's usually this epiphany where you hit rock bottom, uh, and it's usually it's often financially. Uh, you're on the street, you've lost everything. When I read your book, you, you kind of did this, you didn't have that sort of rock bottom epiphany. One of the things that struck me, you had taken a video camera down to South America. And as, if, as I recall, you, I guess, were watching your friends kind of through the lens of the camera and were just kind of appalled at actually seeing what you and your friends had become. Was that a big turning point in your life? 
Yeah, it, it's almost, it was a moment of clarity. And I think, you know, in some ways I hit bottom at the top, right? I hit bottom in a compound with the beautiful people. And, and I, I remember one guy um, with us was, was gambling $10,000 hands of blackjack. And like, he just didn't care if he won or lost, right? So it was almost this, this veil that was lifted that I realized there would never be enough. Somebody would always have a more beautiful girlfriend. Somebody would always have a better watch, a better car, better status, you know, a private plane. And that this pursuit would lead to, you know, even deeper and deeper unhappiness. And there was something about, you know, having the camera as that shield between me. You know, there was, there was a moment where someone was like, yo, film this, film this. And I'm like, what's this? It's just a bunch of drugged out people. Like, there's no this, there's no there there. You know, like, this is amazing. Like, what's amazing? We've been up for, you know, 14 hours. It's 2 p.m. Other people are like, you know, going to yoga. Like, you know, we, we should be going to bed. And yet the DJ is pumping and, you know, the drugs are pulsing. So, yeah, it was this moment of clarity. Um, and then, you know, I had this amazing foundation that my parents had had provided for me. I had the backing of 10 years of prayers. And and I was able really to to turn on a dime and kind of embrace the grace that, that was there for me. And, and in a way, turn a clean page and say, I get a do-over, I'm 28. Like what is, what would act three look like? And what's, what's been so interesting, and one of the reasons I wrote this book is, you know, I, 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 I really believe now no one is beyond redemption. You know, no matter how bad your past might be, the mistakes you've made, the shame, you know, or, or any sort of guilt in that, chances are you're not as bad as me. I mean, unless you've killed somebody, you know, you're going to read this and be like, oh, my gosh. I mean, you know, if this guy could could go from, you know, the depths of depravity to lead, you know, a nonprofit that's raised a third of a billion dollars and like is out there teaching about compassion and empathy and radical generosity, like there's there's a pretty good chance for me. And, and what's been fun is, is you know, so, so where the story went then, um, I sold everything I owned. I applied to these famous nonprofit organizations that I'd heard of. And then, of course, nobody would take me because how, how would a nightclub promoter in any way be useful to a serious humanitarian group, right? They'd take you. <laughs> Doctors, we know how they're useful. But guys who sell $20 vodka sodas, you know, not so useful in Darfur, <laughs> you and know, in the true. mission – Right, the, the mission to, to Sudan. So, so finally, one organization writes me back and says, hey, if you're willing to pay us $500 a month, okay, and if you're willing to go live in Liberia, West Africa, this is a country I'd never even heard of. Like, I didn't know Where's what that, right? Liberia was or that it even existed. Um, and they said, look, we're, we're leading a team of doctors and humanitarian surgeons, and we need a photojournalist. And I said, well, I actually take good pictures. I have a journalism degree at NYU that I've never used, and, and I'm a pretty good writer. So maybe I could tell the 15,000 people on my mailing list, on my guest list, maybe I could actually tell them a new story, a story that mattered, a story that helped people and, and didn't just get them wasted. So I accepted this position. Uh, the beauty was I had to pay this group $500 a month to serve. So, I mean, if I was looking for the opposite of my life, I found it. Right, not even volunteer for free. No, pay to volunteer and then go live in a war-torn country, uh, the poorest country in the world, with a group of amazing doctors who'd volunteered their time. And and so you're on you're I, on a medical boat, right? Yeah, 522 foot hospital ship. Like I, I imagine an ocean liner that someone decided to gut and turn into a state-of-the-art hospital, and bring the best doctors and surgeons in the world to people who just couldn't afford access. So the, 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 the cruise liner would actually sail up and down the African coast, would pull into port, we would have advertised our coming, and thousands of people would be gathered to see our doctors. More people than we could even treat, than we could bring on the ship. Yeah, I've, I've, I've done surgical missions to Africa, to Zimbabwe, and China, and India. And, and you're right, uh, it's... Uh, you know, there's more people than you can possibly serve, and the, the conditions, uh, we would actually operate in, in hospitals, not on a boat, but even there, the conditions are just uh, horrendous. Okay, so there you are, a nightclub promoter, uh, knowing nothing about this, and you're paying rent, and so what happened to you doing that, that you said, 
I've, I've found my calling, but maybe this isn't quite my calling. Yeah. Well, I, I think, and this might help, you know, people that are, that are struggling with addiction, you know, or might have some failed attempts of getting out of that. You know, for me, the environment mattered so much. I mean, I changed environment. So I went from a bunch of people doing drugs and partying to a bunch of like Christian humanitarian doctors who had forsaken their vacation time to, you know, live out their faith and operate on the poor. So nobody was smoking, nobody was drinking. People went to bed at 10 o'clock at night and got up at five. So the environment changed and this, it felt right to me. It felt healthy, it was wholesome. It was, it was a, a place of, of compassion and grace and like, and, and service. So the cool thing for me was I, I immediately just start running around with a camera. I take 50,000 photographs that first year and I'm documenting patients before their surgery and after surgery. I'm living in the leprosy colony. I'm, I'm traveling around the country trying to learn as much as I can about the conditions that we're seeing about the root causes of some of this sickness. And I'm emailing the 15,000 people on my club list, these, these photos and these stories. And of course, some people are like unsubscribe, right? Didn't sign up for that. Too much uh, don't, information. Don't, yeah, way too much. Like, where, where's the Prada party again? You know, where's that party at the Chanel? Uh, uh, but most people said, this is amazing. How do I help? I didn't know that there were doctors out there giving their time. I didn't know that, that there was this ship and, and that we could sponsor a surgery and help somebody get their life back. So I was almost instantly able to redeem the decade of relationships that guest list, you know, email open rates back then were like 100%. <laughs> so, you know, the, the, the feedback loop was, was coming in. And I wound up doing one year, that stretched into two years. And I saw a lot of stuff, and I talk about some of this in the book, but the one thing that just stuck with me was when I saw people drink dirty water. When I went into the villages and saw that children were drinking from swamps and from ponds and from rivers, brown, viscous, chocolate milk looking sludge, you know, ponds filled with algae and, and bugs actually crawling on the surface of the water, but yet this is all that they had. And I learned that this wasn't, these weren't isolated villages. 50% of the country was drinking bad water. So half the people in the country where we were bringing doctors into didn't have the most basic need for health men. And you, I watched, learn, and you watched, yeah. I think you watched a little girl who was, uh, you know, her clothes were brown because everything was washed in brown water. And you, as I recall, you watched this little girl drinking some of this brown water and she immediately vomits it up. And yeah, imagine seeing that. Imagine seeing a child forced to drink from a river because of the condition she was born into. She, <laughs> by no fault of hers, but yet that's the only available water. And then watch a child drink this and then vomit on her shirt. You know, it was, it was, it was horror what we were seeing. And I learned that 52% um, of the disease throughout the developing world, or what some people might call the third world, half of that disease was directly caused by unsafe water, a lack of sanitation, a lack of hygiene. So, you know, if I really cared about health, instead of maybe funding another 50 or $60 million hospital ship, what if I went and just tried to provide people with the basic need? What if I tried to go into that country and help the 50% of people drinking contaminated water get clean water to drink? And, and to me, you know, this was the question behind the question. It was the root cause that I had stumbled into. And I didn't have to be that smart to put it together. You know, thousands of sick people, 50% of people drinking bad water. So I came back to New York at 30 um, and this was going to be my mission, was going to be to to improve people's lives, to end extra extreme poverty by helping the world, everyone in the world, get clean water to drink. And at the time, there were a billion people living without it. So it was one in six humans alive 12 years ago that didn't have clean water to drink. And I'm like, well, we got to start somewhere. So let's just start. So how, okay, so now you've, you've had this epiphany, you realize you're going to help the world and blah, blah, blah. So how does Scott Harrison, knowing nothing about this except how to get a lot of people together to go to a party, translate that into this, I mean, this amazing journey on, okay, how do I save the world, Scott Harrison? 
Yeah, well, okay, I had the issue. And yeah, you know, the circumstances at the time were not ideal for starting a charity. It was not the ideal uh, charity startup climate. So I'm, I, I come back and I find I'm $30,000 in debt because my business partner never paid our taxes, nor dissolved our company. And he's like, bro, like all the mail's in the bathroom. I don't know, I don't even open that stuff. So if you want to deal with it, that'd be great. So, you know, so I immediately get on a payment plan with the IRS and and he lets me sleep on his walk-in closet floor of this this loft that he was living in. So I actually had free rent at the time, which was something. Thanks. Uh, and uh, I'm running around showing people the photos that I'd taken on my laptop, trying to get them to care, trying to say, look, there is suffering going on and we can end it. Like there's a solution. We could go drill a well or build a, a water system in this village and, and we could change everybody's health. We could change everybody's lives. Do you want to do you want to partner with me in this? Do you want to give? And what I learned and again, having the unique benefit um, it, on paper, I was uniquely unqualified to ever be successful with this. But in some ways, I was actually uniquely qualified because I came from outside the trappings of the institutional system. I didn't know how big charity was supposed to work. And as I talked to my friends, I realized they didn't trust big charities. They were not giving to the huge charities that, that we might you know, hear about. And, and people would have problems. They had so many problems. Where does my money go? How much of my money actually gets to people? Oh, I bet the CEO is making millions of dollars and hiring his friends and his cousins and his nephews. And oh, I bet they're just gonna sit on my money and use it for something else. And I would hear expressions like the black hole of, of giving. And I learned there was data behind this. Uh, USA Today came across a poll that said 42% of Americans don't trust charities. And NYU polled Americans and found 70% of Americans said they believe charities wasted money or badly wasted money. So this shocks people. I mean, there's people listening right now that are like, but America is the most generous country in the world. Like who is more generous than Americans? But yet 70% of the people in the country think charities are misusing funds. So I thought, boy, this is ripe for disruption. I mean, if I'm gonna make a significant impact on the global water crisis of a billion people, then I'm gonna to need to completely, I'm gonna to need to create a new model, a new construct. We're gonna to have to reimagine the giving and the experience to get these people back to the table. I wasn't interested in poaching other charities donors. You know, if you were happily giving to another org, that's great. But I wanted to get someone who wasn't giving and say, look, you know, you can trust us. You should be giving, you're depriving yourself by not giving out of your abundance and out of the blessing that, you know, the, the privilege that, that you've been born into. So I had a couple ideas on how to do that. The first was just to create a, a, a model whereby 100% of every donation we would ever take from the public would go directly to projects. And as you've read in the book, I mean, <laughs> opening up two bank accounts, keeping the overhead separate and trying to find people to actually pay that was incredibly difficult. But we believed that if a child sold lemonade and turned in $6 and we could send all $6 to help people get clean water, it would be incredibly powerful, whether that was $6 or $600,000. So the 100% model became this pillar where we said, we'll raise all of our overhead separately, our office costs, our salaries, even our flights, the, the toner for the Epson copier. That's gonna come from a very small group of business leaders and entrepreneurs who, who don't mind paying for that stuff. So the 100% model was powerful. The second thing was just, let's just prove what we do with the money. Let's just tell people, your money went here. Here is the water project that you built. And, and for at the beginning, we were just putting all these projects up on Google Earth and Google Maps. So we would show people the satellite images of these projects as they were built. And we said, we'll prove your money time and time again. And then the third thing, I wanted to build a beautiful brand that was not shame or guilt uh, inspired. I mean, so many charities manipulated people into feeling icky, right? You remember those commercials from the 80s with the, the flies and landing on kids' faces and with sad eyes, they, they look up at the camera and the 800 number comes and they work, but no one tells their friends about those commercials. No one wears the t-shirt. You know, there is a zero word of mouth movement when it comes to a charity that, that makes people feel like that or manipulates them into giving. And, and the brands I respected, the Nikes, the Apples of the world, they inspired people. You know, Apple would run campaigns of innovators, you know, and challenging people to think creatively. And, you know, Nike would say, there's greatness within you. You may not think you could ever run that marathon, but we believe in you. You may not ever think you could climb that mountain if you lost an arm, but we know you can. 
And, and these were the brands that were hope-filled, that were imaginative, that were inspiring. I wanted to do the same thing with charity. Invite people to be a part of a party, a party where the world gets clean drinking water. And, and say, hey, you know, th- just think about fundraising. What are the first three letters? Right? Not Fun. downer, downer raising, not shame raising, not guilt <laughs> raising, fundraising. It should be a blessing to get involved in important causes and, and to, to, to help others. So, um, and then the, the fourth thing was just, uh, the, the fourth pillar would have been, we've got to work through local partners. No guy that looks like me should be anywhere near a, a drilling rig in Africa or India or Southeast Asia. Uh, we could raise awareness. We could get people to care. We could get them to be generous. But the work must be led by the locals in each of these countries. For it to be culturally relevant, for it to be sustainable, it had to be locally led. So our job would be to find these local partners, grow their capacity, and they would get the credit. They would be the heroes. You know, as I played it forward, success would be spending $100 million in helping millions in a country and going there and them having no idea who we were but knowing and celebrating the local partners who actually made that possible, who turned our money into clean water. So we put these things together and I say this now and it just doesn't sound that innovative. You know, it doesn't sound like, you know, we, we are not you know, landing rockets on platforms in the middle of the ocean, but it just worked. It just really worked and people started to give and we would hear time and time again that people were making their first ever gifts, often in their 40s, their first ever gifts to charity because they knew where their money was going and they they believed in the cause. You know, uh, listening to your story, the it's it's amazing, you know, so you, you call it fun, but in fact, as you talk about in the book, there's really nothing fun about digging wells. And one of the wonderful things in the book is you talk about some of the personal challenges with certain wells that yeah. turned out to be nightmares. And, you know, some of this, one of the things that, you know, it, it's fun, but tell me about this. There's a wonderful, it's a horrible story about this young, I think, 13 year old girl who broke a pot of water uh, on the way back to her home. And one of the things that, you know, is so empowering about Charity Water is, and I'll let you tell the story, but this is more than anything about empowering women and girls. Yeah. And that's one of the things that really motivates me with two daughters and a wife and three female dogs. Um, <laughs> so uh, tell me about this little girl and yeah. what, what effects she had on your life and, and how you had to find this, this little girl in the village. Yeah, well, you know, just let me start with water as a women's issue. So I've been to 69 countries. I've been to Ethiopia 30 times now. I just never see men get water. It is culturally the job of the women and the girls to get the water. And often that water is five hours away or eight hours away. Uh, Often these women are raped on the way to the water source. They're attacked by wild animals or hyenas. They're often giving birth down by that river or swamp because they need the water. And it's, it's a real, real challenge. You know, one stat that, that I remember from early on had such a deep impact on me was women just in Africa waste 40 billion hours fetching water. And, you know, 40 billion hours, you kind of like, no, I don't know how big that number is. It, it turns out that it's more than every single human being working in the country of France for an entire year. I do realize the slight irony there, but it, it's, a, it's a huge, like unrealized economy of just wasted time. You know, imagine the GDP that you could put together if that time was turned into productive work. So, you know, I've learned this, that, that water is hugely empowering to women. Um, it's hugely empowering to girls. And, you know, there was this story, it really came at a time when I needed to, to reconnect with the urgency of the work. I'd been making a lot of speeches. I'd been out fundraising and trying to build the organization and dealing with recruiting and just you know, all the stuff that really wasn't the, the field work at the time. And I was in Ethiopia. I was staying in a really crappy, uh, what we call zero star hotel. Um, although one of one of my donors called it a negative one star hotel. <laughs> you know, you, you kind of like you go into the hotel room, it's maybe five or six bucks a night and you, you turn on the faucet and it just comes off in your hand. And then you turn on the other faucet and that comes off in your hand. And uh, we're staying in this room and, and, you know, I walk out into the 
the little restaurant and the hotel owner sits down and he recognized me because I was with our local partners and he said, do you, you guys do all the water work around here? And I said, yeah. He said, oh, well, I'm, I'm from a village very far away. Um, it's called Maida. A couple thousand people live there. And he said, growing up, there was this woman in our village and she would walk with the other women eight hours a day. He said, one day at the end of her journey, she, she like you said, she, she slipped, she fell, she stumbled. And the clay pot that was attached to her back with a rope breaks. She watches her water spill out. And he said, she didn't go back for water. He said, she took a rope, she tied it around her neck, and she hung herself from a tree in our village. He said, the village elders found her body swinging there. And I remember he just let that sit for effect in this little restaurant with you know, fluorescent lights. And he said, the work you're doing is important. And he walked back into the kitchen. I remember um, not believing it. Oh, it's not true, right? You tell an international donor a shocking, sad story, but certainly, you know, no woman is hanging herself because she spilled her water. But it really nagged at me. And, and I asked my wife, um, really permission to go and live off the grid. This, this was so far out. You know, there was no coverage of any, any kind. And uh, I wound up flying back to Ethiopia after confirming with our local partners this story was true. You know, flying up to the north, driving five hours, and then hiking nine hours over the mountains to reach this village. And I, I spent the next week learning about her story. I met her mom. I saw her grave. I met the priest who gave her funeral. I, I, I met her best friend that I, who actually walked with her for water that day. She took me down to the water source. And at the very end of it, I saw the tree. And you know, for me, there was no more visceral representation of the urgency of this work than a frail tree that held a 13 year old's body because she'd slipped. And I asked her friend, I said, you know, why do you think she actually killed herself? And her friend said, well, shame. So she says this through a translator, shame translates well. She said, you know, um, her carelessness meant that her family would have had to go without water that night. And it was even worse, she also broke the clay pot, yeah. which was a valuable asset. So she's, she's spilled the water, she's broken the clay pot, it would have been too much for her to face them. And you know, look, I know every single person, you know, that's with us right now, believes 13 year old girls should not be hanging themselves from trees because they spilled their water. In fact, 13 year old girls shouldn't be walking for water in the first place, uh, walking to some disgusting swamp. So I came back just fired up, like we gotta go faster. We need to help more people. We need more donors, more supporters, more volunteers, more partners. We need to, to make sure that no one is walking, that no one is drinking dirty water. Yeah, and that's exactly right. And, that, and that's a good segue. As, as you know, um, uh, Gundry MD has uh, so far donated uh, half a million dollars uh, to do... To 50 dig. plus wells. Yeah, 50 plus communities. 50 plus wells. And it's all through the generosity of everyone who buys a Gundry MD product. And, you know, I've I've been so impressed. Uh, I don't fly to do missions anymore, but I'm, I'm kind of living vicariously, I guess, in, in the mission field with you. Because, again, 13-year-old girls should be in school, number one. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that none of us realize is that these girls, because they're carrying water sometimes four hours, six hours a day, aren't in school. And they certainly shouldn't be hanging themselves because they broke, you know, their pot. And just, you know, what you've done with all of this, uh, it's, I mean, it's, it's a remarkable story. And not only that, it's really kind of a, it's a fun read. Uh, mm -hmm. Particularly if, if you like despicable characters, folks. <laughs> uh, I, I deliver there. I deliver. <laughs> yeah, he, he really, he delivers really, you know, you, you really end up really either wanting to party with this guy or really wanting to bring him down. But it's, it's, it's funny. We, uh, one of our chief water officers who, who's in the book was, was sitting with two kind of older conservative donors in Chicago um, that had just read a, an advanced copy. And he, he, he calls me and he's like, <laughs> he, said, he asked them, what did they think of the book? And they're like, he was so much worse than we ever thought. <laughs> I mean, wow. But I feel like, you know, tra transparency is our thing. I mean, we made a big bet 
on hyper transparency, uh, you know, many years ago. And I think that, um, you know, you lead with your failures and your mistakes and hopefully that actually helps people because you're just honest about it. Yeah. Now let me, let me bring a touch on something you mentioned, but I want, I think this is so important that you're right. Uh, I am very, very distrustful of charities, uh, particularly, you know, every few years, a big thing of somebody high up in one of the charities and I won't mention names, is living this lavish lifestyle, is flying first class, uh, great cars, great clothes, great foods, dining out every night. You're in the back of the bus on the airplane. You're yeah. you're not in business class, even though you're- Unless someone else is paying for ah, it. Ah, well, like, there you go. If Google's paying for it, you'll, I'll, you'll I'll take go. it. So, no, but that's that's true. Yeah, we've never, we, we've raised over $300 million. We have never bought a business class ticket for myself or anyone else at the org, because we take stewardship really, you know, that, that's, a, that's a value of ours. And I think that's important. And um, the yeah. Other, yeah, the other thing that's important is this, this crazy business model of yours is, you know, you, you literally do have two accounts. There's, you know, some of us idiots, including me, that say, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to give you some money to, you know, buy pens and staplers and turn the lights on so that when somebody gives you money for building a well, you're not gonna, it's not gonna go to keep your lights on or even to buy you an economy class ticket. And I think that's such a interesting way. How'd you ever figure this out? Just a lot of listening, really a lot of listening to people at what they wanted. And, and you know, so you're, you're being modest, so I'll brag on you, you know, uh, Stephen and Penny have have actually joined, you know, year, a year ago or so. The, the 130 families that keep our 100% model intact. So beyond everything you've done with Country ND, um, that's really useful. And and that's um, it's clear though, right? So so we owe you know you and Penny transparency, and we need to win your trust. And I, I just believe that people are open to a lot of value propositions. You know, if I told people right now that my copy machine was broken and we really needed $450 to fix it, $450 would come in right away. People want to meet needs. It's the not knowing. It's the opacity, right? If I tell you, you know, Steve and Penny, our, our greatest need right now is to hire the next water engineer, to hire the next accountant, you are willing to give to that. So for us, it was just this perfect clarity. There's 100% of the public's money directly to go to projects. Then there's this overhead account, and you always know what you get. And now 131 generous families like you have made it possible for over a million people to donate. And people don't know this, but we actually pay back credit card fees. So if someone went online right now and gave 100 bucks with their American Express, I really wish I got the $100, but I get 97. And you guys, the 130 families make up that three dollars. What? And we send the intended hundred dollars to the field. So you actually get a fraction of some water projects every single year. But you know, for us, 100 percent really means 100 percent. And you know, I think you know, integrity is the core value when you're trying to win trust. And there's stories in the book of of how we could have compromised that so many times. We could have, you know, we were going to go bankrupt at one moment before we touched one penny of the public's money. You know, we missed payroll at other times. We didn't pay ourselves because we said we can never touch that. That is sacred. Our promise is sacred. You know, in, integrity has to be at the core of everything that we do. And, um, you know, I, I, I think, um, you know, it always worked out for us. There was always, when, when, you, when you're willing to die for your values, it's amazing how, you know, someone always comes along and kind of, it just, it just works. One last thing, because I think it's so important, you know, charities, uh, okay, you know, and you talk about building a well and the water's gushing out and everybody's clapping and cheering and we're having a party, yeah. uh, not like, you know, Club 54 or whatever. Uh, but here's what is so interesting. You realize that it's one thing to dig a well, but it's one thing to keep that well working. And so you don't just say, yeah. okay, we dug you a well, goodbye, have a nice day. Uh, you now have this incredible system that you guys designed from the ground up to report to you what via satellite what's happening with a well does it need a piece is, is it non-functional yeah. and I think maybe that's 
I think you're modest in that that's probably the biggest differentiator between this charity and others. You're continually committed to what you've produced. It's, I mean, yeah, it's I mean, look, for us, like if we're going to build, you know, Gundry MD wells and then we're going to leave and they break, that's not a win for you or your customers. It's not a win for us. But yet that was actually the status quo in so much of the water sector. We build, we train the community, we hand it over and then, you know, we wipe our hands and we move on to the next. And we said, no, we, we actually want to know that these things are functioning over time. And we tried to solve that problem with technology. We won a big grant from Google actually. And we, we started putting our wells online. So we now have over a billion liters that we're monitoring just from Ethiopia as, as wells are talking back to us saying, here's how much water we're generating every single day. And here's when we're broken. And then when they're broken, a local team of mechanics that we've been training now across many of these countries turn up, respond. So imagine like Geek Squad or Apple Care. Like imagine actually if your if your iPhone broke and a few days later someone knocks on your door saying, Hi, it's Apple Care, I'm here to fix your iPhone. Yeah, I'm here to fix the broken glass. That's the system oh, oh, we're good. trying. Oh, good, it's broken. <laughs> <laughs> That's the system that we're trying to actually design around the world because we think people should have a high quality of service. And then the repairs are actually paid for by the local community. So, you know, we kind of subsidize the setup of Apple Care that turns up at your house. But we think you're willing to pay for that screen. Um, we just want to make sure that we know. And, you know, we're now, the, the whole sensor project is open source. They're incredibly cheap. So a, a charity water sensor now costs 100 bucks that's protecting a $10,000 well. Wow. And, and we're now hoping to roll them out in five countries beyond our projects, beyond our portfolio. So the vision for this is actually um, much more generous. I mean, it's, it's beyond our impact. And we hope that just this technology can help millions and millions of people. Okay, enough about charity water. Uh, people who are watching you, people who are going to get the book, what's your what are personal takeaways from your life changing experience? What what can people get from all of this? Yeah, well, I wanted to share, you know, my my kind of I guess personal <laughs> redemption arc because um, I I believe no one no one's past to find them. So I, I talk to so many people who feel like they're stuck. You know that that purpose has been so bandied about, and they're like, well, I don't know how to find my purpose. You know, I, I do this job every day that I don't like, or I, I would hope that there's there's some glimpses or some things that people can grab onto in the book and say, oh, wow, this is what that might look like for me. And I really would hope to say to people that, you know, you could really redeem anything bad and dark in the past. You can turn that for good. Some of the first wells were built by nightclub owners and by DJs. So the same, you know, the same skill that I'd really developed, I was a promoter. I was just promoting something that was wholly dark, you know, and, and unredemptive. I was saying, get past the velvet rope, get inside my club, spend thousands of dollars on booze, and your life has meaning. For the last 12 years, I've been saying, care about others. Use your time and your talent and your money to end needless suffering. Right, reach your hand across an ocean, be a good neighbor, care about your, your brothers and sisters suffering around the world, and your life will have more purpose and your life will have meaning. So I think, you know, the, one of my favorite um, quotes that I, I kind of talk about at the end of the book is this idea of, of not being afraid of work that is never ending, this idea of work with no end. And I, I think that if, if you can position your life to care about others, to, to figure out what can I do with the blessings in my life, with the abundance, with, with the, the new health, right, that, that some people are discovering. How can I use that to help others? Um, you will live a much freer and joyful life. I mean, it's, I, I, when I was serving myself, I was rotting inside. It was absolutely rotting. And even though I had the car and the watch and the girlfriend and the, you know, it, it, I was rotting inside because it was positionally wrong. It was all about me and it wasn't about others. Yeah, and it, it, it's, in the end, it's all about others. And, you know, as, as you know, uh, the only way you finally love yourself is to give your love away to others and it comes right back. Yeah, my, my, one of my favorite expressions uh, is the more you give, the more you give. I, I, I actually want to get people addicted to giving. 
You know, when when you give and and you get that positive feedback loop and you know that something positive has actually happened, it makes you want to give more. And we need more. We need more giving in the world. We actually need more charity in the world. Even though the word has become tainted for so many, charity means love. It means to to serve your neighbors in need and get nothing in return. And I think, you know, at any time, certainly that I have lived, we need more love in the world. We need more generosity. We may need more grace. We need more people looking after others. And, and I think at the end of the day, that's really the message, you know, is to find your own path and a way to, to do that, to do that authentically. And you will live a very different life. And, and I mean, you know, and, and if you'd come in, you know, if you'd run into me over a plate of cocaine 14 years ago at five in the morning, you know, smoking my third pack of cigarettes and someone said, this guy one day, you know, is going to be speaking in front of 20,000 people talking about clean water and generosity and 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 this guy's going to have raised 330 million dollars for for clean water he'd be like no no not that guy right and now i have a beautiful wife and i have beautiful children and, and i get to do this for a living i get to advocate for others and i get to invite people to bring the best parts of themselves their passion their creativity their 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 generosity into this life-giving thing and and it ends with a day on earth when all of us have clean water to drink where every single person alive has their most basic need for health met unless anybody think that you're uh going to give a uh, preaching about god directing all this which you do an atheist was one of your original <laughs> big contributors so, well, and, and, our, and our biggest, I, you know, look, there, there's an element of personal faith in it. Um, Charity Water has always been a secular organization. You know, the thought to me that you would have to, you know, pray to the God I pray to or do what I do on a Sunday to either work here or contribute is, is just crazy to me. The vision is just too big. So yeah. I, get, I get to live out my personal faith and my personal theology through my work, through serving others, through bringing clean water to people. But, you know, we have Muslims, Muslim school kids during Ramadan send in $60,000. We've had synagogues write us letters and say, this is the first non-Jewish organization we've given to in the history of our synagogue. But water and, and the 100% it's too compelling. Um, as you said, like our biggest donor who's given over $15 million, you know, he thinks I'm praying to a figment of my imagination, but he's been with me to 11 countries now and he's brought his children along and, and he's, he's one of my closest friends. So yeah, that's, that's been, it's been a very big tent. Um, everybody can agree to agree on clean water. People shouldn't be thirsty. You and, know? I, and I think we should end with that. Folks, uh, get this book. It's it's a good read. You're going you're gonna to get involved in this. It's even got pictures in it if you want to see pictures. And normally we answer a reader's question, but I think in the interest of time, I'm going to save it for our next time. Uh, and let them know, uh, all the money goes to Charity Water. So I, don't, I, I turned over the book advance, the, all my author proceeds, that is all going to actually help people get clean water. So just by buying the book, they're actually helping people. Yeah, I mean, this guy is that big a nut that everything, every time you buy this, it's going to go make some wells. So I'm extreme. I mean, you got to, you know, you have a hundred percent model. You got to be pretty extreme. You got to love this guy. So, and I love the book. So get it. It'll be out in your bookstores, Amazon, Barnes and Noble. Go for it. And Scott, pleasure. I'll see you next month and keep up your Can't good wait. work. All right. Thanks for having me on. This is Dr. Gundry, and I'm always looking out for you and Charity Water.